All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our workshop on inclusive citation. Uh, my name is William Ortiz. I am the instruction librarian at the FAL Library. And I'm Shauna Higgins, the Access Services Librarian. And today we'll be talking about the concept of inclusive citation. So just a quick look at our agenda. Today we're going to talk about what is inclusive citation. Uh, we're going to talk about why does inclusive citation matter and for whom. Then we're going to get into the details of actually how to practice it in our classrooms. And then we're going to go ahead and conclude. Okay. So reflecting on one's positionality is a part of inclusive citation practices. Positionality statements have been more common in the social sciences, particularly when engaging in qualitative research, where the credibility of the researcher is in part built on uh, reflecting on their relationship with the subjects of their research, and by clearly articulating their disciplinary framework and worldview, the things that affect the questions we ask and the way we analyze data. So in this spirit, William and I are sharing brief positionality statements. So I am a white woman in a profession, librarianship, that is demographically predominantly white women. I view my work in academic libraries and engage in research from a critical feminist lens. I come from a low-income background where college wasn't encouraged, and I started my undergraduate education at 30 at my local community college. I share these as aspects of my lived experience that I think enhance my commitment to um, inclusive citation practices. All right, thank you. And in the same vein, my name is William Ortiz. I am a first-generation Mexican Guatemalan American male from a low-income background. Um, so that's sort of my uh, lens into academia, that cultural background and, um, you know, the first generation background. All right, so our learning outcomes for today. Um, I was going to have our audience help us uh, read each one. Um, so if I could have a volunteer. Thank you. Our, okay. Articulate some of the material consequences of citational practices in their research and teaching. Well, following the presentation, the participants will be able to do so. Thank you. And the second one, consider strategies for practicing inclusive citation in their research and teaching. All right, thank you very much. And I'll just go ahead and read the third one. Identify ways to incorporate inclusive citation strategies into student assignments. So it's, this is something I like to do. I come from a teaching background, so I always like to state the objectives so that the audience knows what we're going to get out of it. And it acts kind of like a roadmap for me to keep me on track and make sure that's our end goal. And also, before we continue, some acknowledgments. These are some of the scholars that this work is drawn from, and in particular, Jody Coulter, the life sciences librarian at Michigan State University. She developed the template from which we developed this workshop. All right, so before we jump in, we want to hear from you guys. So consider this a sort of formative assessment. We need like a pulse on our audience to kind of know where you're coming from, what your uh, background with this topic is. So we're going to ask you to scan that QR code, and we're going to do a quick little poll um, to sort of just get your sort of gauge what your background is on this topic. So there's that QR code. So the first question is, when looking at sources for my research, I pay close attention to the background of the author. When looking, for, when looking at sources for my research, I pay close attention to the background of the author. So we've got one vote that says sometimes, 
Give it a couple more seconds. And again, the QR code is up there if you want to scan it for those of you in Zoom. OK, we've got an always. All right, that's good. And then we've got more sometimes. I'm glad we're not seeing any never, so that's good. We're always checking. OK, we've got uh, one more always. So it looks like it's sort of split between always and sometimes with the majority saying sometimes. But OK, that's good. Thank you for your honesty. Let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Question number two, and this is a word cloud. When I hear the phrases inclusive citation or citation justice, what words come to mind? And you can submit as many words as you want. Um, so when you hear the phrases inclusive citation or citation justice, what words come to mind? Representation, that's a good one. Equality, diversity, okay. Race, okay. Seeing race again. Gender, all right, gender. Oh, now we're getting a lot more. Um, culture, country, inclusivity, origin. Yeah, these are all great words, I like it. Color, okay. All right, yeah, and we'll be touching upon a lot of these uh, concepts in our presentation. Yeah, I'm liking the par participation. Segregation, that's a good one, okay. Uh, well, not the word, but I like the, the concepts. Uh, mistakes, okay. Correcting, wow, all right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, two more questions. The next one, sorry to cut you off there, is what aspect of inclusive citation drew you to this workshop? So what aspect of it drew you to this workshop? And this is an open-ended question, so you can put a word, a phrase, you know. Surprised, okay. Doesn't really happen, okay. To get help with my own work to cite more widely, good. Wasn't aware, okay. Like a wow, all right, I like that, that statement, like a wow. All right, let's go ahead and move on to, oh, learn better practices, good. Yeah, we're gonna cover that towards the end of our presentation, actual direct practices that you could employ in your classroom. Um, conducting a syllabus with inclusive scholarship, teaching, yeah, how you can use it, um, so yeah, we hope by the end of this, you do take away strategies to how to um, um, implement this into your own teaching and research practice. And then, great, thank you. One final one, and this one will be a, a sort of a simple one. I know what the Matilda effect is. Yes, no, or maybe. I know what the Matilda effect is. I'm seeing a lot of no's. Seeing one or two maybes. All right, so that's something we'll definitely be talking about, and that is a big aspect of inclusive citation, sort of historically where it comes from. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you um, for your honesty, and we'll go ahead and get back to the presentation. I was forgetting my part, sorry. So if citational practices contribute to forming academic disciplines and building careers and indicating whose knowledge is worth uh, learning and teaching, then we should think carefully about the choices we make for uh, to read, write, and teach. So our definition of inclusive citation is the practice of including research and scholarship produced by researchers, scholars, artists, and communities that have been historically 
and continue to be marginalized in scholarly discourse. All right, and that brings us to why does it matter? Why does this whole concept matter? And some of the, um, you know, some reasons might be obvious, some reasons might not be. And we're gonna go over a couple of uh, reasons uh, spanning different disciplines. So one thing to keep in mind is that citing is a coin with two sides, right? When you cite someone, you give someone a voice, um, but when you don't some cite someone, it can act as sort of a silencing. And this sort of, um, I like to think about this as when we talk about a concept of the canon. Um, I was a literature major in undergrad, and we talked about the literary canon. But what is in the canon, right? Who decides what gets to be canon and what doesn't need to be canon? Um, so it's not exactly the same thing, but it's sort of, you know, you can think about it in that way. Who has the power to say this is a voice that's worth being listened to? So first of all, we were talking about the Matilda effect, so let's get right into it. The Matilda effect is the phenomenon where women, historically in science, um, have been silenced or have not been, have not been credited because of their gender. Um, and the opposite of that is the Matthew effect. Have any of you guys heard of the Matthew effect? So that's sort of the opposite of the Matilda effect, is when it's a success breeds from success. So for example, if I see an author um, you know, who's a white male from a prestigious university, maybe you know, Yale or you know, Harvard, I would automatically think, oh, that must be a good resource, you know, just looking at the background. So kind of the opposite of the Matilda effect. And here I have an image of Rosalind Franklin. She was a scientist, she was a physical chemist, who discovered the structure of the DNA. However, she was not given credit for that discovery initially um, because of her gender. And here I have a QR code um, to this project called the Matilda Project. So recently I was at a conference, the um, Digital Pedagogy Institute, um, and one of the workshops was conducted by the creator of this project. And what this project um, does, it's really interesting um, oh, nice. So David says he tells the story of Franklin in his courses. All right. That's awesome. Um, so the creator of the Matilda Project was um, at that conference. And it's a cool project because they're recruiting animators from Disney, from Pixar, to sort of um, illustrate uh, various uh, women scientists and researchers throughout um, the ages who have been sort of not given historical credit. So I thought it was a really cool project. I included a QR code if you guys want to check that out. I definitely want to give more voice to that project because I think it's really interesting. And it has a lot of um, resources for teachers there. So go ahead and check that out if you have the time. So let's take a look at some examples. So here we have a study by Dworkin et al who looked at citation practices in the field of neuroscience. And you can see um, there are four different categories um, with regards to citation. When the authors were both men, when the authors were a woman and a man, when the authors were a man and a woman, and then when the authors were both women. And I mean, it's clear to see um, that when authors were both men, they were cited a lot more than when authors were bo both women. And then we so have both man and woman sort of in the middle. Um, now keep in mind, this is, look at the, the year, this is from 2010 to about 2018. And this was only um, looking at the field of neuroscience. However, I'm sure that similar practices occur in different disciplines. It's predominantly common, more common in sort of the sciences, uh, but um, I mean, it happens in all disciplines. Another study by Chick et al. Um, looked at, asked faculty um, about their sort of principles on how they cite. Um, so this was a study uh, with 121 respondents from 51 different disciplines. Um, about 50 of them were Canadian, 30 were American, and then the rest were from other countries. And they asked about reasons why they cite, basically. What are the um, driving reasons why they cite? And I guess I'll read the top two and the bottom two. So the top two reasons were the reputation of the source and then that the work is considered canon. So again, I brought that up earlier about the concept of canon. And then the bottom two reasons were the, um, it was written by someone I know, 
um, and then the rank or impact factor of the journal in which the article was published. Okay, so this was based on that study. I'm sure we all have, as faculty, have different reasons. I don't know, maybe some of us resonate with some of those, maybe some of us don't. I'm wondering if anyone would like to share here what they think of that. No pressure, you don't have to. I was just saying the item number 10, I wonder if it is written by someone I know is in fact themselves. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think we uh, wondered about the truthfulness of that uh, when we were talking about this earlier. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. So um, let's bring it back to students. We've been talking about sort of research and more abstract things, but let's talk about students. Um, so I think most of you are teaching faculty or um, interact with students in some way. Um, so why would something like this be important to students? So first of all, we want to teach students to critically question um, the sources they are using. So we as librarians, we um, conduct information literacy sessions. What that basically means is we teach students how to research. And we're trying to move away from sort of just procedural knowledge, like go here, click here, use this database, to more of like, why are those sources there? What gives, you know, what power structures exist to bring that source to the top? Why is that source being, um, you know, emphasized and what sources might be being silenced? So it sort of reaches towards critical information literacy. So in general, it's a good practice. Uh, we want to equip the next generation of scholars with the ability to question this. We want to um, let people know, let students know that this is happening, this is still happening, this isn't a thing of the past, and to pay attention to it because that's really uh, one of the main ways we can counter against it. And finally, we want to make the content more relevant and interesting to the students. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a couple slides. So again, kind of just looking at the trajectory of um, a student's career path, um, sort of where this fits in. So freshman, sophomore, you know, you're just beginning to teach them, learn the how to cite and then the why, you know, talk about scholarly communication, talk about giving people credit. Um, by the time they're junior and seniors, we hope they're, um, if they're practicing this, they're keeping track of citation and they're sort of making an intentional effort to find diverse voices. Uh, master students, hopefully by then they're um, able to audit and keep track of citations. And we'll go over a little bit um, how to do that at the end. And then finally, at the PhD level, we have fluent researchers, and hopefully they can begin to um, spread this information to the next generation of students. So let's, um, instead of just talking about students vaguely, let's talk about our students, our students here at CSUSB. So our students are 80% first generation, 70% Latinx. So it's important to keep in mind um, that these are two different groups. They're not necessarily one and the same. So a first gen student might not necessarily be Latinx and vice versa. And whenever I talk about first gen students and the obstacles they face, I try to um, remind myself and then remind whoever I'm you know, giving a presentation to about asset-based thinking versus deficit-based thinking. Because a lot of times in the literature, um, we look at first-gen students in a deficit model, right? Like they're missing information, we have to fix them. We have to bring them up to speed. We have to remediate them, right? Um, but there has been a shift in the literature to more of an asset-based approach. Let's look at um, what strengths they have, you know? When maybe they don't, we don't have to change them. Maybe it's our job to change to, um, you know, to help them succeed. So, um, and then finally, students need to see themselves in the literature. They need to see themselves in the curriculum. They need to see themselves in academia. This is an important point, and I'll talk about it more in a couple of slides. So let's talk about uh, culturally relevant pedagogy. How many of you guys have heard this term? All right, everyone in here. Uh, hopefully, people in Zoom land have also heard of that term. Um, so culturally relevant pedagogy is a theor theoretical model um, that looks at, helps students accept and affirm their cultural identity while developing critical perspectives that challenge inequities that schools and other institutions perpetuate, <clears throat> right? So oftentimes, a student has a home culture, and that's not always compatible with school culture. Um, and a sort of dissonance happens and students are forced to abandon that culture and learn sort of a new um, or a different culture in 
uh, the world of education. So this is kind of trying to bring culture into academia. Um, there have been a lot of articles that say that, um, well, talk about the importance of culture in learning, that you can't necessarily divorce culture from learning because culture is the lens through which um, a student sees the world and uh, the lens through which a student acquires knowledge. So the more culturally relevant, um, you know, uh, content is, usually the more effective um, it is, and that just leads to better learning all around. So again, students need to see themselves in uh, the curriculum. So in a study by Quinones and Olivas, they're two librarians at CSU San Marcos, um, they conducted, they had a credit-bearing course on information literacy using um, Latinx materials, Latinx sort of uh, course materials that were developed by Latinx scholars. And I think this was um, sort of a step in the right direction um, because it really, it showed students that Latinx are valuable contributors to scholarly communities. It really showed them, um, you know, let themselves see themselves in um, academia. And I'm just going to share a quick anecdote. Um, so before this, I had a career as a teacher. I taught in corrections, so I was teaching incarcerated adults. Um, and then I had a, a supervisor um, who was, um, he was a Mexican male uh, like myself. Um, he was working, uh, you know, he was raising a family. He was working full time, but he was also enrolled full time in a doctoral program. And I think that was the first time um, that I sort of saw someone like me and I saw that something like that could happen, right? Obviously, I know that people of all backgrounds pursue doctoral degrees, right? But something about seeing it, because I always thought I could never do something like that, you know, that's too hard. Like, I'm just trying to make it myself to work and, you know, to pay my bills and stuff. But I saw someone who was doing all these things and sort of that, that was sort of a powerful thing that affirms that if I want to do this, I can do this, you know? Um, somebody else here is doing it. So it's, it was a really powerful message. And I think that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about representation um, for our students of diverse backgrounds. And why librarians? So time for us to talk about ourselves, to self-indulge a little bit. So us librarians, we do a number of things. We do library instruction. So um, we go out to classes at the request of faculty and we teach them how to do research. Uh, we call it information literacy. Um, so we're sort of uh, really connected with uh, the research process. We do faculty consultations as well. So we work with faculty um, if they're doing a research project. Um, we help them, um, you know, develop strategies to, to improve their, their research. We host workshops, you know, information sessions uh, on a variety of topics, usually academic. Um, we have workshops on how to cite APA, um, you know, how to use Zotero, you know, bibliographic software, things like that. Um, and we also are part of the scholarly communi communication uh, process. So we also are required to publish and research. So we're involved in that sense as well. And librarians are also keenly aware of how institutional resources and wealth or lack of wealth it, uh, determines students' ability, faculty's ability to uh, be able to find, read, and cite uh, texts that are relevant in their academic work. Sorry, I turned my mic off for a second. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to our first activity. We'll go ahead and have you guys scan this QR code. Hopefully you can um, see that. And we just have two questions we want you to sort of consider right now. First of all, how do you provide opportunities for your students to develop understanding of citational practices in your disciplines? And how do you provide opportunities for your students to become more intentional in their own citational practices? Um, so maybe throw around some ideas. Maybe you don't right now, and that's okay. Um, but maybe put down some ideas of how you might be able to um, include these in your, um, in your courses and in your practices. So we'll give you a minute, and we'll pull that up. Okay, so we've got a nifty little Padlet here. Um, this is another tool for you to use in your teaching practices. Um, but we have two columns here, so go ahead and click on the plus sign and then 
go ahead and put in your thoughts on each question, and we'll give it um, about a minute. Does anyone need us to go back to the QR code? So I'll give you guys a couple moments to just reflect on that and um, share your thoughts with us. Does anyone want to share here in the audience, just verbally? So I require students to cite at least one course text and um, I also then uh, encourage them to use a list of a bibliographic references. So in this case, it's Native Nations and Indigenous Peoples, and I try to use almost all Native Nations and Indigenous Peoples in that list. Uh, and every now and then, a student will kind of catch what I'm doing, but other times, they're just following out this ABC. Um, and then later on, they'll sometimes say, oh, I, I see what was going on. So those are two main techniques that I use. Awesome. Great. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, anyone hearing that, if you hear something that sounds good, you know, teachers, we, we don't steal from each other. We borrow good ideas. So if you think of a good idea and you want to um, use it in your class, um, that's what I like to do. Um, okay. Thank you for sharing. Let's see. Assigning research papers, um, citations. Ask them to create an annotated bibliography. Encourage use of primary sources. That's a good one. Um, why is a paper relevant to you? Yeah, I like that one. Um, again, it's uh, some of you might have heard of high impact practices. Um, so that's um, sort of an important way to have students connect with the content and really apply it in their own lives. So take them through libraries one search. Yeah, nice. Um, allow students to use primary resources, allowing them to explore their essays. OK, don't do this right now. Need to learn how. OK, that's all right. That's why we're having this workshop. Um, in terms of primary sources, I saw a cool activity um, about creating an annotated bibliography using um, sort of hip hop songs um, and using them sort of as a primary resource when the song is talking about sort of like, you know, an event in history or, um, you know, some kind of discrimination that's going on. Um, so there's ways to be creative around that. All right, thank you everyone for your participation. Let's get, we're not done yet. Uh, let's get back to the um, presentation. All right, so incorporating a, my, a more diverse range of scholars into your own research and teaching doesn't mean replacing what you consider the most valuable texts in your field or research area. It simply means including emerging, emerging and or marginalized scholars who are in conversation with those established texts. And for your students, it means building in uh, more reflective citation practices, introducing them to the contextual uh, thinking that will be important uh, beyond college, beyond their academic work, and throughout their lives. So we might think of this, uh, it depends on where you land in terms of using generative generative AI in your classroom, whether you ask students to use it to uh, produce bibliographies or you're trying to mitigate students' use, um, building in more reflective practice can help in both of those instances for students to understand what they're actually uh, incorporating into their work. And more recently, the librarians have do, been doing a lot of uh, research consultations with students who are working on an infographic assignment where they need to find an original research article. So it's really a great opportunity for students to learn what an original research article looks like and what the elements of those are and uh, describe them visually and textually in a concise manner. 
I was thinking that maybe this assignment could go just a little bit further and ask students to uh, look up the researchers themselves and learn more about them. Like what's their institutional affiliation? Are there funding agencies involved in the research? Does the research pertain to a particular geographic region and are the researchers in that region? They might even discover a researcher who's from here in the Inland Empire uh, while they're doing that. So these are some of the reflective questions you might ask as you're developing syllabi or assignments. Um, like what voices should be included in my syllabus? Um, again, the geographic region that pertains to the research you're wanting students to learn about. Are there particular groups that you're studying? And are there uh, researchers or published material from those groups? And then there's um, uh, accessibility. So there are scholars who are publishing in different ways than what we're accustomed to. And if we're studying those groups, are we using material, video, audio, other forms of publication? And again, some of the questions you could have students uh, think about when they are choosing to cite a resource where are the authors from, what aspects of their positionality might pertain or be relevant to the research they're doing, and are they transparent about um, their own perspective and what they bring to their research. So now I'm going to ask you all to go to the Inclusive Citation LibGuide, and we're going to use that as a jumping point for actually doing some searching for more diverse voices. I'll give you a minute to get that up. And navigate there myself. You can also find it by going to the library's homepage, down to the library guides tile, and looking for the citing and writing link, and down to inclusive citation practice. So here we've collected some further reading materials if you're interested, some databases, which we will use in just a few minutes for finding more uh, diverse scholars, new and emerging, and marginalized voices, and some uh, resources that you would find in our library databases, as well as some open access publishing sites. There are some diversity audit tools that you can use. You can put your reading list into them. Um, or your bibliography for a research article. They are, though, kind of like blunt instruments. They only know as much as they can glean from that citation. Um, so yeah, not necessarily reflective practice, but a tool that you can use. I don't think so, no. So the question was, what would our? Just we've sent, like last year, we had about 80 people participate in whether it be the Chancellor's Office Initiative or the one we have here locally through Faculty Center for Excellence um, around inclusive or equity-minded pedagogy. And I just wondered if the facilitators of the workshop, at least here locally, knew about these resources because they're so relevant to that program. So maybe just being in touch with um, Fadi and Fadi here and Brad Owen would be great. So yeah. they can see this. We can share it. We just built this for this workshop, so it's it's new. And then there's a teaching resources tab. So some examples of tutorials that have been built in this case uh, by other 
academic libraries, the grade test, which is a test to see if you're incorporating at least kind of a minimal um, amount of diverse voices in your work. There are links to some activities you could try out with uh, your students. And I'd like to point out this teaching citational practice link. There are two volumes of this, and they're published by faculty in different disciplines, and they describe um, how they've incorporated more reflective citational practices in uh, their classes. So someone's talking about biology writing assignments, engineering, um, composition instructor talking about how gender uh, shows up or doesn't show up in uh, articles. So please explore these. So I'm going to demonstrate a couple of ways you might uh, incorporate uh, trying to find more diverse uh, resources. So the first method I'm going to use is using OneSearch, which someone already mentioned. I don't know if I'm going to do this very well holding a mic. I know we weren't prepared for having to hold mics. <laughs> so going to re uh, OneSearch, I'm going to search for something we're familiar with, uh, critical information literacy. And then I'm going to look for peer-reviewed uh, journal articles related to that. And then I'll come back to the mic. All right. Search for critical information literacy. I am going to click on peer reviewed journal articles. I'm going to scroll down and see what I've got. And I'm going to find the article I'm interested in a librarian's experience teaching critical information literacy. And let's say, you know, I read the full text really interested in incorporating this into the article I'm writing or assignment. So I'm going to look up Latia Ward. I'm going to Google her. And I'm pretty sure most of you have Googled folks. So this is probably a familiar activity. So maybe a lot of us do this anyhow. We look up scholars and find out a little bit more about them, find their institutional websites, um, what pub other publications have they on their CV. So I think the most recent here is the University of Virginia School of Law. And we learn that she is a law librarian. So. In our field, that's a fairly unique perspective when we're talking about information literacy publications. I also see that she's visibly um, from a marginalized community, a black librarian. We have a very small percentage of black librarians in our field. And I could explore her other publications and find out more about her and then determine if I want to include her work um, in my article or syllabus. So the other way we can find diverse voices is on that inclusive citation guide. Going back to the diversify bibliographies and reading lists, and I'm going to try out the Cite Black Authors database. So many of these databases are still growing. So be careful of your expectations of finding a lot of stuff. So this particular database doesn't work great if you're looking for a specific author. 
and not great if you're looking for a very specific subject area. So I'm going to search for gender, a broad uh, subject area. And what I get back are some article and book citations, as well as some of the experts here uh, that write or uh, research on issues of gender. And these are also databases that need people to um, add to the databases. So if you are aware of scholars that should be in some of these databases, you can contribute uh, citations to their work and biographies of them or encourage those scholars to do it themselves. So I'm going to go back to our slides. And we're going to give you a few minutes to use one of those tools yourself or use the OneSearch method and find out something more about the author or authors. Yeah, so we'll give you guys a couple minutes. Um, try searching something on one of those tools, and then we'll ask you what you um, were able to find. So we'll give you guys a couple minutes while you're doing that. I want to comment sort of on the point that Shauna made about um, looking up res uh, researchers and then finding um, potentially researchers who are active in the local community. Um, I myself do research on Hispanic serving institutions um, and culturally relevant pedagogy. And a relevant or uh, prolific author in that area is Gina Garcia. Um, so I was reading a lot of her articles before we actually hosted her here um, a couple of semesters ago, I think. So that was a really cool opportunity to be able to, I actually met her and got one um, her signature. I got her book signed. So that was a really cool way of sort of connecting with, um, you know, a researcher. And that really goes a long way to putting, you know, a face to just a name in the sea of names of research. For those of you that have tried out one of these databases or used one search to look someone up, does anyone want to share what they found? Did they find anything new? Or anyone in Zoom land? Am I being impatient? Should I move on? Yes, yes. All right, you guys can keep. Yeah, you guys can keep exploring those resources as we uh, move along. Yes. The gender balance assessment tool, GBAT. I kind of tried to, to look at that, but I'm, you know, I can't do things on my cell phone. <laughs> and with this, you know, the Padlet, that's the, the thing. Um, so my question is like, I, we use APA a lot. And so there's only the initial of the first name. And so if I enter that, is it, can it find the, the gender? Is it going to tell me? No, that's what I meant by they're really just blunt tools and not very good at the nuance. One of uh, the articles in that teaching citation practices actually explores different citation styles and APA in particular in that it kind of makes invisible the gender or uh, and so how do you draw attention to that in the text when you're not showing that in the footnotes or 
uh, bibliographies. And another thing that I keep seeing is that um, a lot of the people I cite, um, and and I do research on global media and global, you know, global south, uh, media in global south, and it, it's a lot of the time, it is. Um, they are the researchers based in Western countries, kind of writing and publishing, and those mm -hmm. are the ones that I'm I'm getting most of the time. Other than uh, when I write about the Turkish media in a global context, and of course, you know, I have access to people writing in Turkish, publishing in right. Turkey. Um, so that in, I I wonder sometimes if there is a way that I can find out their kind of institutional background without actually kind of doing extra digging and going to their Google pages and, and all that stuff. But I think probably at this point, there's nothing like that automatic. Maybe AI is going to be able to tell us. <laughs> Maybe. Right? <laughs> at some point. That would be a good use of it, yes. But you're right. I mean, that kind of gets at the well, geographic region, but also also the bias in publishing itself that tends to favor uh, North American, Western, yeah. There was one database I listed on the guide that Cielo, which is actually really good if you're doing Latin American research because it's a database that um, most universities in Latin American countries require uh, researchers to publish their work there, open access. And we are at 1249. This last slide was just an, an indication in our field uh, of what a syllabus might look like if it changed. So in uh, library and information science master's programs, there's usually always some sort of management and leadership class. And the first one is, so they're both current. They've both classes offered in the last couple of years. And the first reading list is very established text. It's Bull in, and Bowman and Deal is something that is assigned in most classes. And then the second reading list is what it might look like when you uh, broaden the scope and start looking uh, at not just the established uh, materials where you're incorporating more subject areas like sustainable libraries and actually supervising uh, folks. Um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about that. And now to our conclusion. So going back to our, oh, we've got three chats, sorry. We have Raj saying, why do you think this is a main issue? Should one be worried about the matter of race, et cetera? So this isn't just about race, right? It's gender, it's uh, your institutional affiliation, it's your geographic region, are, are you, um, what else is it about? It's about Ability, a whole range. neurodiversity. Um, and yeah, that's a great question. And I think that sort of gets to one of our questions that we get a lot is why should we worry about the background of the author if we just want the best content that's out there, right? Why should race or any of these other factors play into that? Well, I guess I would say that, uh, well, there's David letting us know it's about inspiring students. I think that connects with what William was talking about as in seeing yourself as a scholar uh, by seeing others like you that are scholars. Yeah, I agree 100% because I'm a graduate student and I'm studying English composition and writing studies along with literature. So as a student, I typically find myself gravitating towards uh, scholars that are similar to me or have any type of like diverse background as well. And I've been noticing that just um, throughout as an undergrad, but also as a grad, uh, my experience with like just looking at like syllabi from like my classes, that's something that I definitely aim to look for. And as I am planning to enter a 
I want to pursue professorship. So as I'm taking this one class, we're going to have to be conducting the syllabus and all that. So I think um, uh, I was looking at these resources, and I definitely found a whole bunch. Um, it was a bit hard to find some within my field of study, but I eventually found some, just like kind of like exploring the, the page. And I definitely found a lot within my field. So I think this was definitely beneficial, because I know for students, just like you guys were mentioning, uh, culture and, and the learning environment of like the schooling definitely has to be like inclusive for me because that's something where I really find myself engaging. But since I also work at the writing center here, that's something that I naturally see with students. Like, oh, I want um, sources that can kind of like cater to my topic of interest or like my own identity. So I think this is very beneficial. But yeah, I just wanted to share that real quick. Um, this is very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And yeah, just to add to that, um, I think one thing, we're not saying don't cite white people. Um, that would be impossible. Um, but we're saying sort of broaden your view to um, include other voices along with the ones you might include um, already. So yeah, that's my thought. Yeah, it is a big question. It is a big question. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we've come to the conclusion just to um, put some spotlight on some upcoming workshops we have going on. So uh, tomorrow, actually, we have a workshop on building your scholarly profile by, by Dr. Jennifer Beamer, one of our colleagues. Um, so that's going to be a really good one if you're researching, if you're a junior faculty, if you're a grad student, on ways to make yourself like, more visible as a scholar, as a researcher, um, you know, setting up an ORCID profile, things like that. So I'm actually going to be attending that one. And in November, we're actually having another version of this workshop uh, geared towards more towards graduate students. Um, so that'll be November 6th. So encourage your fellow grad students. Thank you. Well, thank you all for attending today. Yeah, thank you all for uh, being engaging, uh, being an engaging audience. Um, and we'll take questions now from Zoom land or from um, our live audience. Oh, and we'll put our contact information up. I think that's on the next slide. Yeah, so if you want to reach us through email or through phone. That's me falling out of an airplane, by the way. We can do that. I think it's directly uh, through Williams. Yeah, um, so this workshop's being recorded also. Um, the question was, can we share sort of like a, a outline of uh, bullet points of the questions we had and then the links? And yes, we can do that. Questions to share with students. So sort of like lesson plan ideas, you mean? Or just like discussion prompts? You can, yeah, pick and choose or adapt or, yeah. Sounds yeah, good. definitely, we can do that. And some of that's available on the library guide that we provided. Uh, but we can definitely uh, share that point. I'll send that to you. Or we can or send offerings. it to the participants. Yeah. yeah, OK, we can do that. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so here are our, our references. If you all want to check some of those out, do we have any other questions? I think we're starting to exit the room. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.